Welcome to today's Partner Academy Live webcast, accelerating your research with Windows Azure. Kenji, you now have the floor. Thank you very much. So thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, let us know if, if you can't. Uh, so I'm Kenji Together. I'm in Microsoft Research uh, Connections team uh, based here in Cambridge in the UK. Um, and our team is uh, actually uh, working with the research community uh, to, to look at how cloud computing can help you with your research. Um, we have a, a social media stream, so uh, um, hashtag Azure Research. Um, and handle that Azure for research. So, so do uh, get onto Twitter and, uh, and tell your friends uh, what's happening here. Um, so what I want to do is uh, talk about, uh, I'm just going to grab control here. Um, so um, I want to talk about uh, how uh, cloud computing can be used uh, and why you might want to consider it um, for your own research. So there's a lot of talk about cloud computing and um, uh, Microsoft's uh, platform is called Windows Azure, uh, and, and that's what we'll be talking about today. So we will talk about Azure specifically, but we're going to actually talk about uh, cloud computing in a more um, sort of broader sense uh, in terms of how, uh, you know, it's applicable to your, your research. So it's great to have uh, so many of you here. Um, so to start out, really, if we think about sort of research and scientific discovery, it's gone through several phases from experiment to theory and mathematical equations through to computation. And I don't know how many of you are sort of uh, high performance computing, supercomputing people, but that's, that's my background. My background is actually in aerospace engineering and doing computational fluid dynamics. Um, and, you know, the middle box here is called the Navier-Stokes equations, and I basically used to spend my time trying to solve that equation, uh, which is pretty much impossible for, for interesting uh, problems. Uh, so we would move to uh, computers to model that. Um, and the picture here shows, for instance, a climate model um, on a supercomputer to try and solve those problems. And so that, I think, is a framework for how we do research in terms of experiment observation, theory, and computation. And as we're moving forwards with um, you know, bigger computers, more sensors, more advanced uh, theories, uh, we're actually moving into a world where data is very critical um, to what we do. Um, so this idea of data intensive research, which Jim Gray, uh, one of our researchers at Microsoft Research, um, has coined this as the fourth paradigm of data intensive uh, scientific discovery. And, and, and the fourth paradigm.org, there you can download the book. Um, which explains and has some essays um, about how this new way of thinking about science uh, is really sort of changing um, the way we do things. And, you know, we think about the scientific process, the research process, where we might acquire some data, we might work with our colleagues before we do some analysis, um, and then we also, you know, have to share those results uh, and then publish and archive and preserve those things. And that's sort of a, a fairly linear process that I think a lot of us are familiar with. Um, but what's interesting is that if we take that data and we share that data, anybody can actually tap into that. So the Human Genome Project is a good example of that. The Large Hadron Collider is a good example of that. Uh, and I think that's what we mean by this fourth paradigm, really, is it sort of unlocks lots of new ways of doing research um, and with our scientific discovery. So, so that's the sort of world I think we're moving to. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in, in pretty much every, every discipline, you know, we think about particle physics, um, we think about environmental science and climate change, uh, but it's very interesting in, in sort of social science uh, and the advent of social media um, and the internet and, and gathering data that way that, again, this model um, is emerging within those sorts of disciplines. So a lot of people find that difficult. It's quite a shift in the way that uh, researchers are trained. Um, and sort of we, we imagine a world, world where what we do at our desks um, and in our labs, um, you know, and we do that with our lab notebooks and our laptops and our computers and increasingly things like tablets and even phones, that actually we want an extension of our desktop, a sort of magic uh, back end that helps us with our problem solving. Um, some examples of, you know, a spreadsheet, for instance, that would just allow us to run genomic um, analysis on hundreds of servers, um, the ability to write a simple script in, for instance, sort of Python um, or MATLAB, and then it would just automatically go and run analytics across thousands of images, whether they're MRI or X-ray images um, from, uh, you know, a CT machine, um, or actually pulling data from remote instruments. And you can see in the in the top uh, uh, top right corner here, 
actually an ocean observatory off the uh, uh, Pacific Northwest, where again, you know, they have on the seabed high definition cameras and sensors, um, and, and, and pulling that and analyzing that from the desktop. Uh, and so these, this is a sort of um, nirvana, really, for, for scientists and research. Uh, uh, if we could do, if we could only do this, you know, this would uh, create a, a real revolution in, in what we can do. And I think that's where, you know, we see cloud computing as one of the enablers, not the only one, um, but a key part of, of enabling this new capability for everyone across um, lots of disciplines. And that's really kind of what we're talking about today in terms of, you know, how we, we can apply that uh, and also uh, uh, specifically about how you would go about doing that. And, you know, this is the first of a series of webinars um, really to try and um, understand, in this case, what cloud computing is good for, and then in, in the follow-on webinars actually getting hands-on um, and, and looking at that in more detail. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about cloud computing. And cloud computing um, over the last few years, um, you know, has been talked about quite a lot. Uh, and I think it's really matured. And that's something where there are definitions appearing. And NIST, for instance, have, has a definition, which is a very precise definition. Here, I'm actually going to take those definitions and put them more in the context of, of sort of research and researchers. Um, so a way of thinking of this is providing on-demand services delivered over the network. And cloud computing now backs so much of what we do. With our smartphones, when we access our email, if I take a picture on my phone, that picture gets uploaded into the cloud so I can look at that on my tablet or my, my PC. And so the ability for these services to be delivered over a network connection, be that a wired or a Wi-Fi or a 3G or a 4G connection, um, is really sort of the essence of cloud computing. Again, we can get into more detail about the exact definition of sort of uh, you know, protocols and things, but, but I think this, this sums up what cloud computing means, particularly in the, in the research space. Um, so do, um, you know, I am your questions in, and, and I'm happy to sort of uh, take questions as we go along so that it's, it's in context uh, here, so, um, so do feel free to, to chip in. So what's that good for? What it means really is that you can have what you want, whether that's compute or data, or you need to pull data in from devices, or you need to distribute data out to, to many people, um, getting what you need. And you can do that today, and with a lot of IT infrastructure, that is possible, but a critical part with cloud computing is that you get it when you need it. Sometimes there's the resources are there, but you can't have it you know, at your fingertips when you need it. And again, that's one of the features of cloud computing um, that's, that's unique, really, is that, that you don't have to wait. Um, you essentially have access to what you need whenever you need it. And that's one of the nice things about cloud computing. We'll talk about some specific scenarios in a minute. Um, and what that means is that you can focus on your research. You don't have to worry about oh, I've got that paper deadline coming up, oh, in two months, I better put in a request to get some computer data uh, resources, because, you know, you're busy doing your experiments, you're busy, you know, writing your code and debugging your code, and so, you know, what you really want to be able to do is focus on your research at the time that's right for you, the particular part of, of what you're doing, uh, and not have to worry about, you know, pre-reserving what you need, you just kind of want it when you need it, and I think that's one of the real beauties of, of cloud computing. And so I just want to sort of tell a story. So Jung Rao Ryu is at uh, Seoul National University, but this is a picture of him when he was at Berkeley um, doing a, his research as a grad student. And you can see there um, in red, you know, that's his PC. Uh, and I think, you know, certainly my office used to look like this uh, when I was a researcher with paper everywhere and, and my machine and, and uh, you know, needing to do lots of computations. So he actually is an environmental scientist. Uh, and so NASA provides some remote sensing data, this MODIS data set, which it, it makes freely available to researchers around the world, which is a, a fabulous um, resource. Um, and Jung Rao had to run uh, calculations against this data set, and it's, it's gigabytes of data. Um, and actually, his problem was actually just downloading that data set was a huge problem, and then computing it because his PC was not powerful enough uh, to do that. And so cloud computing uh, here is really what sort of unlocked you know, what he, he could do. And so, uh, so the young Rel is really a, a great example of where a scientist, um, you know, in his lab really had a, a task to do, and he was really constrained by what he had available to him. And there are obviously 
great resources for researchers and scientists with supercomputer centers, national data centers, uh, and it's wonderful, and cloud computing fits into that, uh, that ecosystem. Um, and for a lot of scientists, though, actually, you know, I think some of you might be able to, to relate to this sort of situation, certainly when I was a grad student, and I had access to supercomputers, um, but still found myself in, in this situation for a lot of, a lot of the time. So cloud computing makes a difference because it allows you to go beyond your PC or laptop. So again, you know, earlier we talked about that sort of nirvana of, of having access to, to compute and data. And this is one, cloud computing is one way um, of, of doing that. And again, this, this on-demand, um, not having to wait in a queue, you know, not having to submit your job, wait for a day before it runs, find out that actually it couldn't get the license it needed, or it crashed and it core dumped. Uh, and having to wait another day, you know, you can just keep iterating and submit the job, it fails, submit the job again, debug, and, and get to the answers. Um, the other thing is the ability to scale out, as with Jungrel, to do these big data computations with gigabytes, terabytes, even getting into petabytes of data, which are just kind of not possible. So this has got a new capability for researchers. The other thing in the cloud is very good at sharing your data in the same way that things like SkyDrive allow you to share photos and files with your friends and family. You know. The cloud allows you to share data with your local team, your university, your collaborators, and more globally. And then, uh, powerfully, we can build services on top of that, and we'll talk about that um, in a minute. And the other thing with cloud computing is it, it, it allows you to pay for what you need. You know, you get what you need when you, uh, you know, when you need it. But it, again, you pay for it. You know, just for what you need. It's not the only way. You can you can um, pay up front for um, you know resources that you know you're going to need over a period of one, two, three, five years. Um, but also you can pay on demand as well. So it gives you that flexibility um, in a similar way to, for instance, a sort of mobile phone uh, type of arrangement. And so that that I think uh, sums up um, what cloud computing can do. You know, to, for researchers. Um, and what I want to talk about now quickly is then what um, sort of patterns and when is cloud really applicable. And so I'm just going to go through some of these scenarios of different compute and data scenarios, um, these four key um, scenarios for, for cloud computing. So one of them is what we call sort of an on-off workload. So this is where I'm sort of maybe writing some code, experimenting, you know, experimenting my theory, doing debugging locally, and then I want to run a big job. Uh, and so that could be a batch job. So this is typically how we might use a supercomputer, uh, where we, you know, we fire off batch jobs, we get the results back, we spend a little while analyzing, or a long time analyzing those results before we then fire off another batch job. Um, and so what we find is we need a lot of compute for a period of time, and then we, we can do everything locally, and then we want to, um, you know, have some more compute again. Um, and so this is, the, the, one of the problems is having to queue uh, where you might have a provider, you know, that provides you access to the system, but you're competing for those resources. Um, and with the cloud, because we provide the cloud at sort of a very global scale, um, essentially we don't have to queue. Um, and you can just switch on the compute when you need it. It switches off when you're done, uh, and, and, and that's really good. And it is hard to handle conventionally at a, a local research group level, at a university level, and the cloud provides a lot of flexibility um, to do that. So an example of that is this uh, piece of work on stratospheric research. So um, uh, environmental scientists and engineers at the University of Southampton, where, where I used to work, you can see here in the, in the, um, the bottom corner here, they have a, a balloon, uh, like a, a weather, helium weather balloon. Uh, and they happen to have attached, actually, a, a sensing device. In this case, it happens to be a Windows phone um, that has um, various environmental sensors on it. It has GPS. Um, and this is taken at about 60, 70,000 feet in the stratosphere. Uh, and then as the balloon's going up, it, it's collecting data on its trajectory here, and then it's, it's running actually a trajectory calculation in the cloud, beaming it to a phone app so that they can go and recover the balloon. And this is an example of an experiment where they spent a long time planning the experiment, and then they need that cloud compute you know, for the duration of about a day, and then they don't need it for another month until they need to run another experiment. So, you know, you could do this with a server under your desk, but, um, you, you, you know, that server would be doing nothing um, for, for 99% 90, of the time. So the cloud's very good for this on-off um, sort of scenario of running these experiments. Another scenario is where you're growing fast and you need to scale quickly. 
Um, and this is, again, all of these scenarios are equivalent for both compute and also data if you're generating data. Um, and it's quite difficult for providers, you know, again, for a university level or even at national level or a, a research group level to provision hardware fast enough to do this. Um, because often there are lead times, uh, you don't know how quickly you're going to scale. And this is where the cloud's very good. I can provision 100 servers. Literally, if I started provisioning some servers now, by the end of the webinar, I could have 100 or 1,000 servers up and running. Um, if I had to do that and actually provision hardware, that could take days, weeks, or months to do that. And so the ability to, to, to ramp up quickly uh, is fantastic um, with cloud computing. And so an example of that is with some of our researchers in Microsoft Research under David Heckerman, who looked at uh, analyzing um, some uh, genomic data. Um, this is a very large data set, which is actually on, on what we call our Azure Marketplace. They have an algorithm called Fast LMM, which allows them to do what's called genome-wide association studies. This is interesting, because this Fast LMM is actually a linear algorithm where the previous state of the art is order n squared, order n cubed in, me in memory and compute. So the algorithm means that they can, they can uh, do much bigger computations. But combining that with 27,000 cores on Windows Azure, it meant they could do 1,000 compute years uh, of work in about uh, two weeks. Um, and so again, it shows the power of the cloud when they spent a long time developing the algorithms, but when they needed it, they could burst out onto thousands of cores, you know, run those results, and then you know, ultimately um, publish those results, uh, and again, go around that loop again. So it's a good example where they needed a massive amount of compute, 27,000 cores. There are bigger machines in the world, um, but the ability to spin those up when you need them um, you know, is, is hugely valuable. So that's an example then of, of scaling up, scaling out those computations. Um, another um, pattern is this unpredictable burst. You're doing some work, and all of a sudden you need some compute. You didn't know you needed it, um, but, but all of a sudden you need it, and you know, one of those things is paper deadlines. You know, you're working on your paper, you get to Friday, you've, you've debugged everything, you think, oh, actually, I need just 100 machines for a day to hit my deadline Sunday night. Um, you know, the IT department's closed, you know, you might have to queue for more than a day. When you queue, you don't know if you're going to get what you need. With the cloud, you can log in, fire up the machines, run your computations, write up the results, submit your paper to meet your deadline. This is, you know, again, shows the power of the cloud where, you know, we don't always know what's around the corner. Or even if we know that paper deadline is there, um, we're often um, doing things right up to the last minute. And so the ability to spin things up in the cloud is very, very valuable. Um, and so this, again, I think, um, certainly when I, when I was a researcher, um, you know, this sort of mode of operation was not unusual for my group and other groups uh, within the university. Um, uh, and so one example here, actually, is weather forecasting as a service where we've built and we've taken some NOAA uh, weather forecasting code, one of the, the open weather forecasting codes, deployed it onto the cloud. So you can literally click uh, on, on the map and run on demand uh, a weather forecast. So here you can see some weather forecasts. When you click on the map, you can run a, run a simulation, and it will go and run on the cloud. Uh, and you can then um, browse your results through the web browser. So weather forecasting on demand through a web browser, back-ended by the cloud. And again, you can run hundreds of these simulations um, at a time because the cloud just scales out. So again, it's an example of this uh, unpredictable burst. And sometimes uh, we have predictable um, characteristics. So we know when we need the capacity. This could be daily, it could be weekly, it could be when we run an experiment, and we know the run experiment runs for a couple of hours, and we need to do some processing, and then we do the acquisition for a couple of hours. So this sort of periodic um, behavior um, is very hard to accommodate if you're trying to provide this type of uh, compute or data infrastructure. But the, the cloud allows us to, to sort of match our resources with what we need. Um, an, an example there is uh, it, it was um, space, space junk simulation, um, where um, it's a real problem. Um, so Sandra Bullock and George Clooney have discovered this with the, the film Gravity. In the film Gravity, you'll see this, that, that space debris junk orbiting around the Earth is a real problem. But what happens, actually, is that NASA publishes uh, twice a day um, their essentially radar returns for all the space debris that, that's currently orbiting. Uh, and so, again, my team at Southampton, when I was there, built this pipeline on Azure that twice a day takes in the data 
and then processes it through Azure, and then pushes it out into visualization uh, into a tool called Worldwide Telescope that we've developed at Microsoft Research. So again, this happens twice a day. So, so twice a day, we ingest the data, we spin up hundreds of cores, run those cores for a couple of hours, they spin down, uh, and then, and then you know, we do that again after 12 hours. So the ability to spin up lots of compute, run a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations, spin them down again, and do that twice a day, again, is a really good scenario for um, uh, for, for cloud computing. So, so those are sort of four of the key scenarios, I think, that show you this ability to scale with burst, sustainable scalability, and again, sharing data through the cloud to allow us to collaborate. And again, if there are multiple teams that all want to share the same data, putting it in the cloud is a good place for everybody to do that. And it means we don't have to have multiple copies because the cloud actually does that anyway. And we get this economy of scale, and we can do sort of pay as you go. So that um, hopefully explains a little bit about um, what cloud computing can do do for research. So um, this webinar is part of our program at Microsoft Research, which we call Windows Azure for Research, um, where we're trying to, again, work with you in the community um, to figure out where cloud computing could help you. Um, and we've been running um, some training courses around the world. So we've been in Switzerland and France recently. We've been in Korea. We've been in China. We're going around the world. Um, and if you go to the website azureforresearch.com, you'll see our uh, training course program. You know, you can actually email us and say, hey, we'd really love to host a course for you. Um, you know, can you come talk to us? And also we have an Azure Research Awards uh, program uh, where we are um, – giving out um, chunks of Azure resources in terms of compute and data for people to work for 12 months on, you know, good-sized projects to allow them to prototype and develop on Azure. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more towards the end. Um, we've also very recently published, just this week, um, some technical white papers. A lot of the things I'll talk about here today, if you go to the website, um, you'll see half a dozen uh, white papers that go into much more detail and walk you through a lot of the things that I'm talking uh, today. And then research community engagements on LinkedIn. Um, uh, we have a, a group, which I, I think, I, I hope some of you, uh, you know, heard, out, heard about this through the, through the LinkedIn group. Uh, and then on Twitter as well, sort of that, that conversation on Twitter that we're having as well. So please do join in uh, with all of those things. Um, so that, I think, was sort of the first half, really, of the session I wanted to take you through where cloud computing could be um, used and some of those different uh, use cases where cloud computing really makes a, a lot of sense. So, you know, if you've got questions on that, you know, fire away and ping those in. Uh, I actually have a question for you as well. So I think we should have a poll here, Stephanie, on the uh, different uses of cloud. So I, I kind of wanted to ask you, you know, I've gone through some of those scenarios, sort of, you know, what, what sort of things do you think you, you would uh, think about using, using cloud computing for? Um, uh, and so, you know, dive in there, and again, dive in with any questions on that. But I think you can see, and again, you know, after this section, we'll go through um, Windows Azure in a bit more detail, because it's not just about storage and compute. There's lots and lots of other uh, scenarios here uh, here as well. So, uh, so yeah, do, do vote. And again, if you're not sure, that's fine. Um, you know, hopefully by the end of this webinar, uh, you'll have a better idea. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, cloud computing can be used in lots of different ways. And I think one of the things that a part of our Azure for Research program uh, is giving you the ability to explore with Windows Azure so that you can, you know, discover for yourselves um, how uh, you can use, use the cloud. So I want to talk, um, not for too long, but just to give you a, a bit of a flavor for, for what Windows Azure is. And, you know, there are other cloud computing platforms out there. Um, Microsoft has probably one of three uh, what we would call global public clouds, uh, where we have data centers, and these data centers are, are large. They're the size of sort of 10 football fields, and we have millions of servers across the globe. Um, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Europe here, in the U.S., over here, um, we're just opening up in China. Uh, so we have our big data centers here in blue, uh, and then have what are called edge data centers, which get us closer to some of the um, – some of our users, and this is all connected via our own private network um, so that we can guarantee uh, the connections between the data centers, and that's very important in terms of allowing resilience uh, and sharing of data. And because we operate at this scale, we can do a lot of our own R&D 
And so, um, you know, when we think about uh, servers and data centers, we think about racks of servers, and I think most people would be familiar with the sort of racks of servers. Uh, most universities and, and research orgs would probably, this is how you would deploy, you know, tens or hundreds of servers. Um, but when we get to the scale of global cloud, um, we started to think about shipping containers, um, you know, sort of 40-foot standard shipping containers as, as ways of putting in um, servers, essentially having three connections out of each container, which would be um, basically uh, power, network, and cooling. Okay, so three connectors, and we plug that container in, uh, plug in those three connectors, and we have suddenly hundreds of thousands of servers online. Uh, and so that's worked well in some of our, you know, Chicago and Dublin data centers. Um, but we've moved beyond that into what we call IT pack, where we've custom designed what that container looks like. So we don't even have to put up a building. We just put one of these, what we call an IT pack. Um, we put a little covered walkway in between in case it's raining. Plug that in and we can get a data center with hundreds of thousands of servers up in a matter of a few weeks. If you're interested in this aspect, um, do have a look at what we call global foundation services because they run Microsoft's data infrastructure across the world. Um, so for instance, with the new kind of Xbox launch, like Xbox One this week, um, you know, one of the things is the Xbox is backed by um, these servers, 300,000 servers dedicated to Xbox uh, One um, in these data centers around the world. Office 365 runs out of these data centers, Bing Maps runs out of these data centers, Bing runs out of these data centers. Um, and so Global Foundation Services can actually do the R&D that you are now doing a, a, a fuel cell powered uh, container as well. So really trying to get these data centers very, very efficient and green as well. So, um, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time, and there are very few companies that can, can do this at this scale, and, and, and you know, we're very fortunate to be one of those companies. And so there are different flavors of cloud computing. Um, what we call is, is sort of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. So you can think of this in terms of hosting machines and virtual machines, uh, building out services, and then consuming services. Uh, and so that's sort of how we often think about cloud. And when you read about cloud computing, you'll see these acronyms come up. Um, and so Microsoft, we support all three models. Um, and this is a way of thinking about it. If you think about software running on your own machines, you're responsible for everything from the networking stack all the way up to the application. Okay, and if I run, you know, I think about my laptop or I think about a server. When we think about infrastructure as a service, we we virtualize that. Okay, um, and so we, we don't have to worry about the hardware level. We worry about everything from the operating system up. And then we can go to a higher level of abstraction, uh, which is what we call platform as a service. This is a little bit more like your mobile phone. If you think about how you use your smartphone, you worry about your applications, you worry about your data. Um, so with my smartphone, um, uh, I had a problem with my smartphone and I had to get a replacement smartphone. And that was fine because, again, all my applications and data were backed up in the cloud. I resynced my smartphone and I was up and running within, you know, 20 minutes. Um, and I didn't have to rebuild all of this lower in the stack because that's taken care of. Um, by my essentially provider, which is, you know, the smartphone hardware and, and, and my network operator. And then we can go beyond that as software as a service. And if we think about things like um, email and outlook.com, you know, the other email services, that's really software as a service. And so if you think about this in terms of research terms and what you do as a researcher, the job of a researcher is not necessarily, you know, managing this whole stack. The job of a researcher is really de delivering a service. We actually talk about now in Microsoft Research, research as a service. Uh, and, you know, can we build things on top of the cloud uh, that really provide, um, you know, things like, you know, think about email and that the, the ability for me to access my email from a smartphone, from a web browser, from a tablet, from a PC, from anywhere. Think about research services, and, and we'll actually talk about that. Uh, talk about that next. Uh, and so Windows Azure is about sort of virtual machines, cloud services, and, uh, and websites. Uh, and actually, to go into a bit more detail for some of the some of you who who know about these things, um, you know, we have essentially compute, uh, compute, data, and networking at the bottom here. We support big data and things like Hadoop. Uh, importantly, I think is that we support. Uh, multiple runtimes and languages, so things like Python, Java, 
um, and we're very open. And so all of our SDKs are available open source on GitHub. Um, so again, it's, it's an open platform, um, you know, bring whatever you've got and we can run that on Azure. And that's, that's something, you know, real take home really is that uh, when you play around with Azure, don't be afraid of it. Just, uh, you know, come in with what you have and I'm sure we can support that for you. And so I really want to go through and, you know, do, do pitch in with any more questions on that side as well. So I want to talk about some real examples of, of research applications um, on Azure. So and I want to go back to Jungrel, our friend Jungrel. Um, at Seoul, at Seoul National University and this problem he had. Um, and so he had this problem with, 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 with NASA MODIS data and doing that. So, it was, so we actually helped him to create uh, a pipeline in the cloud that allowed it uh, us to download the data actually in the cloud, process it in the cloud, reduce that data using his scientific algorithms so that he could do his science. And, it, you know, it's quite a team because this was quite, you know, groundbreaking work um, with folks at MSR, University of Virginia, Berkeley, um, Stanford. Um, and so a great, great team of researchers uh, and software engineers to do this. Um, uh, and so this is the pipeline. So NASA has all the data. And the idea was to pull that data from NASA into the cloud, so not previously you would have to download this locally onto your machine, gigabytes of data, um, but actually we keep it in the, in the cloud, and essentially we have this data processing pipeline where we do map reprojection, and then we're doing actually our scientific uh, derivations and an analysis reduction stage, uh, and then this was running on hundreds of nodes on the cloud, and then actually Jungrel could download his data uh, locally. So all of the heavy lifting was done in the cloud, and then he could download the data locally. So we extended this project just this year with a tool called Fetch Climate, which we've developed here in Microsoft Research, actually in the Cambridge lab here, um, which is a, a cloud-based service where we host tens of terabytes of data on the back end, uh, and you can actually query that data uh, using this uh, Bing Maps interface. And I can draw a box and say, okay, draw a box, show me the temperature in Africa, you know, between 1990 and 2000, Fetch. And so this is, this is a tool we've been developing to make it much easier to get climate data, climate information from lots of what are otherwise freely available data sets anyway, but they're often locked away behind portals which non-experts find it difficult to use. And what we did is we've worked with Jungrail now to take his Azure processing pipeline, and rather than have Jungrel download those results to his local machine, where only he can benefit from that, we push it into our Fetch Climate system so that any researcher around the world can benefit um, from that work that jungrel has been doing. So very much what we call sort of Science 2.0. Um, you know, how do we do the analysis in the cloud, scale out, but allow us to share those results? So again, you know, and, and Jung Rao, we presented this in Beijing at our, our annual eScience conference, and Jung Rao's just over the moon that we've actually gone that extra mile uh, with the cloud, not just doing the processing, but being able to share that, that data. So that's just one example in environmental science. Another example, we have something called the Azure Marketplace, where you can publish data. And in the UK, the Met Office, who supply all of the weather forecasts for the UK, both for civilian, for TV weather forecast radio, but also to the military as well, um, they've made those forecasts open. So you can go to the Azure Marketplace, and you can get the daily forecast, five days forwards, the three hourly forecasts, and the observation data. So if you do a web search on Bing um, or, or other search engines, go to Open Weather Data Azure, you'll come up with this, and you can actually query and get that data. It's a great example of where the UK Met Office, a national organization, had to publish that data and make it open, and they used Windows Azure to do that. Um, uh, and this, you know, this is servicing something like half a million downloads every month, half a million requests for this data every month, a very, very important data set. Another uh, e example is where we need to do this computation. So. Um, we worked on a project called Venus a European Union project on cloud computing with a team at Newcastle University and Cancer Research UK. They had to do these uh, drug toxicity calculations, so essentially calculating the safe dosage of a drug um, and trying to do that in silico in, in, in the computer. This they used to run on a single server, which would take about five years to do the calculation, but they scaled this out onto Windows Azure, and they could then do it in less than a day, half a day. So it's a great example of taking that workload, taking that calculation, um, which basically you just wouldn't think about doing because it would just take too long in five years, and it changes the way they think about their do the way they do their research. And so again, it's an application, you know, sort of off the cloud.
Um, and this is a great piece, and if you look on the Microsoft Research Connections blog, we literally just published a couple of days ago. And it's, again, trying to rethink how we do genomics. Um, and it's a way of using the cloud to run queries um, against uh, against this uh, data. So what they, they've created, the team at UCSD and MSR have created what they call GQL, Genomic Query Language. So like SQL, but for genomes. And they're using Azure to be able to run those queries super fast so that then researchers can either run their computations in Azure or download the results of those queries, you know, accessing, you know, sort of, you know, around 100 gigabytes of data, but just making it so much easier for researchers to do that. And again, the cloud is a, is, is, is a platform for that. So this is hot off the press just this week. In fact, the paper on this is available on the Microsoft Research website. Um, another example um, is uh, a tool we call Biomodel Analyzer. Um, and so this is actually a model of um, cells here. So this could be actually a layer of skin. Uh, and Biomodel Analyzer allows us to run analysis that shows whether cells um, essentially will reach equilibrium or not. And this is key, for example, at looking at things like skin cancer. Uh, and so this is actually about using, actually using formal methods that we use um, in uh, programming languages, um, but applying it in the biomedical domain. But what's interesting here is you see a web browser, um, but all of these computations are running in Azure. Again, so it's a very nice interface, very much this idea of devices and services um, uh, but pushing out into, into the cloud. Um, so building out those services can take some time. And again, you know, our training courses and technical papers um, are trying to, to help you do that. But a very quick way of getting onto the cloud is if you have a virtual machine, um, and those can be Windows or they can be Linux. We have something called VM Depot, uh, where you can put your Linux virtual machines. And we work with the community, for instance, um, to put the Bio Linux virtual machine, which is very widely used in the bioinformatics community, um, onto Azure. Um, and then other um, machines we've put up there. So CCAN um, is a, an open source, open data portal used by a lot of open government data projects, but also being used increasingly by universities for that their research uh, data portals, again, you can deploy that onto Azure just with a few mouse clicks. You know, otherwise, you would have to spin up, you know, go and buy some servers or, or spin those up virtually uh, locally and get those up. But literally through the management portal with a few mouse clicks, you can spin up these, these virtual machines. And we've just published actually one that we use on our training, which is what we call our data science core, which is IPython, NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn with machine learning. Pi tables um, as, as a Linux VM, again, that you can spin up very quickly. Um, and so those are some things, if you just go to VM Depot, um, you can get up and running very, very quickly on, on, on Windows Azure. Um, so that um, really hopefully shows you how Windows Azure can be used across lots of different domains in some of those different modes, infrastructure as a service through virtual machines, through cloud services and websites and uh, showing how we can scale out, scale up, share data, um, all those um, different patterns that we talked about uh, at the start. Um, so hopefully that's, that's uh, given you a bit of insight into how cloud computing might be applicable uh, in your work. And so again, just as part of our Azure for Research program, the Azure Awards, um, we awarded 35 awards worldwide in these, uh, these areas. Um, so in urban science, urban computing, smart cities, essentially, uh, in machine learning, uh, machine learning, the cloud is fantastic for machine learning because you can put large data sets up there and then you can crank these big, you know, learning algorithms against them and then, you know, share those results with people. Environmental science, we've seen some examples with Jungrel, with Fetch Climate, and we're doing work in hydrology, for instance, we're doing work around climate change uh, and some of actually the data sets used for the IPCC assessment report that was recently published and working on scaling that out onto the cloud. Life sciences, we've seen some great examples on life sciences in biomedical with medical imaging with genomics um, in computer science so we've got a great project on recomputation um, and, uh, with Ian Gentis and Andrews and trying to create reproducible computer science research papers so you can click and rerun the analysis uh, of what somebody's done and again in engineering and doing work in, in uh, mechanical engineering and quantitative finance for instance so it shows I think the broad applicability where some of these design patterns can be applied.
you know, across many, many domains. Um, and so again, you know, those are some examples of the awards. Um, we run these awards uh, deadlines every couple of months. Um, so do go onto the website, uh, do talk to us, do submit, because we're really keen to see what your ideas, we're really keen, the idea with those awards is to realize some of your ideas, get you prototyping, developing, deploying on Windows Azure so that you can really benefit from the cloud for your research. Um, to help that, we are running these training courses. And again, you know, we are running those worldwide across every continent except Antarctica. But if there are people in Antarctica who really want to run a course, you know, we can discuss that. Um, but running this, these courses worldwide and the webinars here, um, you know, thank you very much for joining the webinar uh, live. So do, you know, ping us your questions live. Um, but these will be available on demand afterwards as well. So it's another resource um, f for you to work on. And please share these with your colleagues. And as I said, the technical reports are online now um, just this week. So do jump on the website. Have a look at those. They're very detailed. Some of them are high level. Some of them are very nitty gritty. Click here, click here. Get your virtual machine up. Share your virtual machine on VM Depot, so a broad range uh, of resources for you there. We will be running some research community events, and we have like with our eScience workshop, and again on the website you'll see some of those events. LinkedIn is, is a, a primary mechanism that we're using uh, to, to disseminate, so again please for those of you who haven't joined the group, uh, please do join the group and do invite your friends um, along as well. And again, with Twitter, with such a vibrant community around cloud computing, research, um, you know, we're part of the Research Data Alliance, you know, open access, all of those conversations tie into cloud computing. And so very much want to uh, engage with the community um, globally around that as well. Um, so that's really um, the uh, program and this webinar is the first in the series and we're running a few now. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback on other webinars that you would like to see. Um, and we have one on Linux virtual machines and again going into detail on how to spin those up. And we've got another one around environmental science where we've got some of the researchers. We've got Tanya Berger-Wolf at University of Chicago who's doing some very exciting work um, out in Kenya tracking animals, looking at social interactions of animals, um, and using the cloud to do that. And with some citizen science, um, for instance, with people taking pictures of zebras in safari parks, uploading those into the cloud, identifying the zebras from their stripes, fantastic piece of work with Tanya Berger wolf that we're working on, and also with our colleagues in Chile working on a project called Live Andes around conserving uh, endangered species in Chile and using the cloud, again, to go out in the field, capture the data, and use the cloud to disseminate and collaborate. So those are some webinars that we've got coming up over the, the, the next few weeks. Um, so please do join us, uh, join us for those. Um, so, um, so with that, I think, thank you very much um, for joining the call. Um, if you've got any uh, questions, um, uh, do, do sort of fire those into us um, over IM if you can. So, um, so uh, thank you very much um, for that. Uh, and uh, I'll hand over uh, to Stephanie, I think. All right, yeah. great. Thank you, Kenji. Um, I've enabled the survey for our webcast. Um, please just take a moment to enter your email address and answer the survey questions. They're on a scale of one to five, with five being the highest. We hope you found today's information helpful. If you enjoyed today's webcast or have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, please let us know. This concludes today's Academy Live session. All materials from today's presentation will be available um, through a link that will be distributed via email post-session. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter, Kenji. We'd like to thank you for joining our Academy webcast. You may now disconnect from this call.